Welcome to another video from Robotic Mower Services. Here I have a 435X. We'll zoom out here on it a little bit. Show you. We're, we're looking into this button right here. Uh, on the 435X, it's actually a wheel. It's called the jog wheel. But you navigate through the menu on the mower. On the 535, it looks very similar, but it's just a button. You just push it up and down, and that's it. You cannot, you cannot rotate it. Uh, so what our, our thing is today that we're doing is there's been an issue with these uh, sticking and there's two main reasons why this sticks. You know, you, you use this, whether it's the 435X or the 535 EWD, <clears throat> when you go to turn the mower on, this is your, your power button on both models. Um, on the 435X, You'll use this to navigate through the mower's menu, and then you push down on it to select your option. So what will happen is it'll, it'll stick down. Um, one of the main reasons why I was doing that was the this button right here on top of the switch. When somebody would start pushing that down a whole lot, you know, or getting really rammy with it. Or if it was out there just mowing around on a very, very hot day, plastic would expand just a little bit too much, and that button can easily slide down over the the shaft of the the switch further than it should and if you've got grass built up under there dirt and debris there you go it's stuck there we go we got one stuck again so sometimes you can just rotate it and it will come back up and then you're good to go but the problem is on this when you rotate that you push that down but when you rotate it now you're changing the option for what you wanted in the menu and you eventually got to come back to it anyway and there we go it's stuck again right so they did redesign this this button this cap here um, if you're having issues with yours sticking down that's the first thing to start with to make sure that that's not a problem uh, they're they're very inexpensive to replace um, but when you have one that's stuck like that, a lot of times you can get your fingernails in under there and just pry that up off because it just pries right up. Other times you got to get something really thin in there and just gently pry up on it. I say gently because this, this is all part of that screen for your menu right here. And you got your LEDs under here and everything. So you don't want to chip this or crack this or break this. You don't want to jam anything big like a big flathead screwdriver down there. You just want something you can gently get under there on a 535 you would have to work your way around on this one here obviously because it rotates you can just keep it the same spot and just keep prying up on it you know until you get it off of there now you do want to make sure when you go to put this back on the switch on one side does have a flat on it and you want to line that up with the the side of your uh your button here that has the flat as well but the other reason why this thing sticks down is due to the switch itself and this one here so when you when you push down on this you can see that it should get that you should get that that uh double pop sound where it 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 latches when it bottoms out or it um it not latches but uh you know it, it makes the action from it it bottoming out and then you'll hear the the pop sound again when it maxes out when it's coming back up so listen closely here so you can see that that is working but when you get it spun around here in just the right position like there it went down but it did not come back up let me zoom in on this a little bit maybe you can get a better a better view a little bit closer view would help you see what's happening what's not happening so here you can see that's going down and then coming back up we spin it over to here there now it's not coming back up not coming back up not coming back up again not coming back up again so in this case the switch needs to be replaced so good news and bad news on that good news is that you can replace it bad news is 
as of right now, Husqvarna North America does not have just the switch itself. You have to get this whole assembly here um, and replace it all in one unit. So the good news is the part is available. You can replace it. The bad news is it's a little bit more pricey because you're getting all this other stuff. But, hey, at least we uh, we have an option there, right? That's that's the good thing. And um, they, they make it pretty easy to do because you're, you're replacing all this. Like the switch, is every, everything is already assembled in there and good to go. So for this process here, uh, what we got to do is we have to start by removing that that trim ring right here so we can get in there and we can access the, the four screws that hold this part down and remove this, this trim ring back here at the back corners. You just pull out on that and that will unclip. There we go. <laughs> the whole thing just came right off. But normally either side, you unclip it at the back. You, you can see here. Uh, there's a little clip right there, and there's there's one there. Once that only clips, then in the front, it slides over a little um, part that sticks out there. So when you get the back part unclipped, you just slide that front, and it comes off. So then we're down to, you'll see the four screws around there. You want to make sure to clean all this out. Um, I'm going to take the time right now to go ahead and, and clean all that out before I go taking this apart, and then we'll get back to it. All right. T20 Torx bit, you got screws in all four corners. <clears throat> Gonna take them out. <clears throat> and then on this side over here, there's a warranty label there. So you're going to have to remove that because this will not pull up because that's going across the seam there. So you got to peel that down out of there. <clears throat> that peeled down. And then you want to gently lift up on this because there's a whole lot of wires and cables under here connected to this. And you don't want to go yanking any of them off of there and... Um, not being able to figure out where they go or putting them back in the wrong plug or anything like that. Now they did lengthen uh, one of the cables that was causing an issue or, you know, that would come unplugged when you go to lift this up because it, just, it was just too short. So just lift up on this easily. And you're going to just pry front on it a bit. And, uh, I'll move the camera around here so you can see everything in here, what I'm talking about. All right, this is under our top cover here. You can see all these cables and wires here plugged in. Um, you know, if you know what you're looking at, it's not bad. But, you know, if you're doing this for the first time and you lift this thing up, let's say that ribbon cable right there comes unplugged. Well, do I plug it into this port or do I plug it into that one? Because they're the same thing. Could go either way. You have these cables right here, these gray ones, one here and one there. They are for your magnetic sensor boards. Now they're not as likely to come unplugged because they they're basically like a uh, like a phone cable. That's basically like a phone jack on there, that black box they plug into. Um, so yeah, very unlikely for them to come unplugged. But when you go to put this thing back together, you're gonna need to know where they go. So it's a good idea when you go to take this thing up like this, take a picture of what goes where and, and how those wires are routed around through there. Um, you can even just pause this video right here if you do this and you're not sure where everything goes. So uh, that's the reason why you want to be gentle when you lift this up and then you're going you're gonna to need to reach in there and unplug each one of those before you can lift this up off of there. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then we'll get back into it. All right, you can see those uh, just random wires sticking up through there. You know, aren't you aren't you glad you took a picture of that so you know what was what and where it goes and have a better idea when you go to put this thing back together? So with our, our top piece out here, this underneath here, you want to be very careful in handling this because this is your application board. This is basically your, your main board for <clears throat> one of these fourth generation mowers. And there's a lot of delicate electronics on there. But one thing in particular you want to watch for is this right here. This thing here, this ribbon cable will tear very easily if you do not pay attention and you are not careful with it. 
So you need to remove this application board because again, you're replacing this entire thing right here. So to remove this application board, you have to take the screws out. There's one here, one down here in this corner and one up here in this corner. So you got the three screws there. This plug, this is for your, your switch, the one that's causing the issue. That's a real simple one to unplug. Now this, like I said, very easy to just rip that. The way this disconnects is this black uh, flap right here on this connector. That actually lifts up. So you want to gently just flip that up without causing any damage to that ribbon cable. There we go. So just flip that up. You see that? Flips and latches. Be very careful with that. Gently pull back on that. Get that out of the way. Now you're ready to take your screws out. They are Torx bits. Uh, They're smaller than T20. I'll try to get you the size on that because off the top of my head I can't remember. Or they also have the they also have the slots in them. You can just use a straight head screwdriver if you don't have the smaller Torx bit. So uh, grab my Torx bit and uh, we'll get ready to take this apart. Okay, now I'm going to put the new chassis seal in here around this area where we put the, the that top assembly in that we just finished putting back together. Uh, pretty self-explanatory if you've seen any of our other videos about replacing a chassis seal. You know, it's pretty straightforward. I just wanted to show you up here on this one, you know, on, on all the spots where you put one of these in, there's usually some kind of an indent to, um, to show you where to start with your seal because it, it'll overlap when it comes around. Uh, on this one here, you have an indent right here and you have an indent right there. So you would start to seal on this side and then go back around this way. Or you'd start to seal on this side and go around the other way so that when you come back through it overlaps. Um, you know, I'll show you here once I get done what I'm talking about. If you've never seen how one of these chassis seals is replaced and why it's important to overlap it like that. Okay, our chassis seal right here. You can see we started on this side of that arch. We started right there at the, uh, the, the cutout right there, that index point. And now when we bring this end around, we're going to go over top of that. And then this is going to come out through this part right here and just tucks down in there. Now the reason why you want that bit of overlap there is so that that compresses, bear with me here, let me get this in the right spot, so that that compresses and seals up and you don't have a gap in between, between this end and that end of the seal. That overlaps, it's going to smash all that down together, it's going to seal up. You know, you don't have to worry about, oh, well, it's double the thickness there. Now nah, it's foam. It'll it'll squish down. That's the way it's made to work. So just in case you didn't get a good view of that earlier, because of my bad camera angle. <laughs> there you go. You can see this is the end of our seal where we started. And then the other end is going to finish and come out through this gap right here. So we're overlapping about a half an inch right there. And that's the way it's done. That's the way it's done on the ones for... All the other mowers, when you put the seals in, you look for those index marks, and you get that little bit of overlap. So there we go. Chassis seal into place. We're going to put our board up here, or our uh, assembly up here, and plug all these cables into our board, and then fasten this thing down. All right, so before I go putting this all back together here, I'll explain these wires that you got coming up out. These cables right here, these gray ones, they look like phone cords, and they work just like a phone cord. You have a little latch on the top. To, uh, to remove them, to unplug them. Uh, they are for your magnetic control or a magnetic sensor board, sorry. Um, <clears throat> like your little board that you have over here above your, your, your joystick, that's what these are for. So you have the one for that side. Uh, this is your ribbon cable for your automatic connect board. Over here you got another gray uh, phone cable. This is for, uh, again, magnetic sensor board. Uh, this one here, the four plug, this is your main power. This is, you know, coming in from your battery. And this is also coming from uh, your motor control boards. So the, the power and all the information coming from everything in the back of the mower goes into the control board in the front. And then from there back out to the application board. And then this one right here, the thin brown and white one. 
This is for your switch cable. So, or I'm, yeah, yeah, switch cord. Uh, sorry, not switch cable. The switch cord to switch underneath behind the stop plate or the stop switch, that plate there that shuts the mower down if somebody tries to lift it up while the mower is running. So that's what you got going on there. That's what these are. Obviously, this gray one here, you can see that it, it curves out underneath that side, so you know it goes on that side. Same way with this one here. And then um, <clears throat> this this one here, there's only going to be one spot to plug it back in. And this one here, there's only going to be one spot to plug it back in. This one, though, there's two different ports. So as I said before, it's a good thing to take a picture of where all this stuff is at before you go and plugging it or... Because you watched this video, you can get back to that spot in the video and pause it, and you can see exactly where everything was plugged in at. All right, so enough with that. I'm going to put this cover back on here, and then we can finish this project up. All right, so we got our cables all hooked back up. We got our top cover assembly here set back into place. And as you can see, um, <clears throat> everything is working properly on this. Everything is lit up, so it should be good to go. Now, um, we got to put our four screws in there, one in each corner, again, turn them backwards, get them to pop into place, and then take them down in, not tightening them up right away because you want to compress that, that foam seal evenly. And you want to make sure you don't have anything off to the side so you're not stripping out any of the holes that you're threading these metal screws into. <clears throat> and you don't want to use power equipment for this because you will end up ruining it. So, yeah, it might take a few more minutes. Yeah, might seem like, oh, that's the old-fashioned way to do it, but it's the correct way to do it without damaging it. And to make sure that if there is a problem, you can take this thing apart over and over and over again. So we'll go around here and just snug these down a little bit at a time so we can press that, that seal nice and evenly. So there we go. Everything is sealed up there. Everything is tightened down. Oops, bump that. Then it's just a matter of putting your, putting your trim ring back on. Again, like I said, it's got that cut out in the front. You're going to just, you'll see the, the bump out on the front of here. You're gonna line that up and get that to pull back in there. And then just push this down, push that down, push in from the side, and you get it into place, and it will snap right on there, just like that. That's it. So that part is all complete. <clears throat> so now we should be good to go, right? Our button works. I mean, it, it just works. At least for now, anyway, right? Because it's brand new. It's nice and shiny. Uh, we got a brand new screen on there. What else could there be to do? Well, it's a toss-up. Uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. If you do this repair, there's a good chance that now you can take this thing out in your yard and you can tell it to go, and it's going to go, and it's going to work. There's also an equal chance that it's not going to work without a trip to the dealer to have them connect it to the auto check program to do a post assembly calibration. Technically on these all wheel drives, you should do a post assembly calibration anytime you replace any kind of component like that, uh, especially anything electrical. Um, <clears throat> you know, anytime you've had the application board unplugged, anytime you've had a magnetic sensor board unplugged, you should do a post assembly calibration. And what that is, is the post assembly calibration, let me slide this back here so I can uh, give you a little bit more of a rundown on this. Post assembly calibration, what you do is through that dealer, uh, dealer specific program, you go through there and you calibrate everything, make sure the front end is in line with the back end, make sure that it is level, so the tilt sensor is working properly. Um, also, the, the collision sensors, that they're working properly. And the, the big thing is that these magnetic sensor boards in here, you know, they're going to be the ones that are going to say, oh, there's a collision. Oh, yep, this bumped into something. They're also the ones that are going to talk to each other and say, 
Okay, we're right here, and we're going straight forward. You guys, you're not in line with us. You're off to the side 180 degrees. So that's an important thing to do. Um, like I said, sometimes you can put one of these together, and you can put it out there, and it'll go. But I just want to warn you ahead of time, if you think, okay, I'm just going to replace this switch, and then I'll have no problems. I can avoid going to the dealer. You can give it a try, but there's no guarantee that it'll work because when you unplug all that stuff, it de-energizes, you plug it back in, it re-energizes, and there's always the, the possibility of, you know, while you had that apart, everything kind of reset, and now it's, you know, these boards are talking to each other, but it's like they've been out of high school for 20 years, and they don't really know that much about each other anymore, you know, and they have to get reacquainted. Um... I know this, again, I'm talking from experience. Just a week ago, I replaced a switch cord assembly on one of these. I put it back together, you know, switch cord assembly. It has nothing to do with any of this stuff. It has nothing to do with the magnetic sensor boards or any of that. When I replaced this switch cord, put the motor back together, started up, right away the back end went at 180 degrees and was fighting the front end. You know, it can happen on these all-wheel drives because of all the electronics, because of the system where everything's made to work together. Like I said, you have that stuff disconnected for a while. Um, there's definitely the chance of it happening, and that's why they suggest that any time you replace one of these parts, uh, the, the post-assembly calibration process is done. I'm saying that not just so you, the homeowner, knows that, um, but also the dealers know that because there's a lot of dealers that for some reason like to skip that part and think that it doesn't even matter. Uh, I shouldn't say it doesn't even matter. It, they, they think it doesn't matter, and there's a lot of them that don't even know how to go in there and access that function in AutoCheck to perform that, that process. So that's it there. Uh, that's my warning. Um, you know, this is something obviously you saw me do. You could easily do this on your own, but be warned that afterwards you could have that, that issue where you do have to take it to the dealer and get them to do it. Obviously, if you just spent the time to put this in there and you've got everything right, um, you're going to save yourself a little bit of money because you're not paying them the labor to do it. Uh, that's, that's really it for this project here for the replacement of our button and, and why these things tend to stick down. Again, you can just pry these right up off there. Um, you know, damn, my fingernails aren't long enough to do it and I have to grab my knife, but uh, you can pop that right up there and clean all the dirt out, you know, to keep that from uh, screwing that switch up, you know, in the future after you replaced all this and get everything back and working again. We have those parts available, usually. Um, part number for that, that assembly, as of right now, is the time of this video, of course, this stuff can always supersede later on, but the part number is 597-1622-01, or if you want to look this up on our website, you would just leave the dash 01. Uh, you want to put the dash in there, just 597-162201. Cover assembly, HMI, 435X, all-wheel drive. Uh, obviously, that will be different for the 535. And the reason why it would be different for the 535 is because this button right here is different. The button on the 535 has a little leg that sticks down in there to keep it from rotating. A lot of people don't know that because they haven't been around 535s, but... Yeah, it's basically the same thing in there, uh, the same switch and all that stuff. It's just the button is different, and that way you can't use the jog wheel on it. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of bonus information. Um, that's going to do it. As always, if you're looking for automowers, parts for automowers, accessories for automowers, technical support for your automowers, visit our website, www.roboticmowerservices.com. If you cannot find the parts, the accessories, the automower, or whatever you're looking for on our website, there's plenty of ways on the website to do this, or you can just jump to sending us the email uh, right through whatever email service you use, roboticmowerservices at gmail.com. We get flooded with emails from around the world, um, you know, when it comes to technical support stuff, so bear with us you know there's only so many hours in a day and we do whatever we can to try to help everybody out the best we can but yeah when you get into the the prime mowing season we do get a bit of a backlog because uh we we have such a large customer base and so many people reaching out to us that's gonna do it for this video um you know if you have any questions concerns comments you can leave them on the video Again, you can send us an email, roboticmowerservices at gmail.com. 
Uh, let us know what you got going on. If you do need technical support with anything, make sure in your email you have your model number and your serial number, and uh, that will help that will help speed up the process and, and get things rolling quicker. Um, anything left to say is be sure to subscribe to this channel, and thanks for watching.